Good morning. This month we're talking about the many colors of love. I added the word many, but that's all right. It's like you're my mirror. So these are titles were written by our younger generation, and I love that title. It's like you're my mirror. It's like you're my mirror. <laughs> ah, I love it. Abby Shava Stein grew up in the ultra-Orthodox Hasidic community in New York City. And this particular Hasidic community was ultra-Orthodox because they only spoke Yiddish. She never learned English, so she knew nothing about the world that surrounded her when she mentioned that she had never heard of the Beatles. That's when I really got. She seriously never knew the world around her. So it was a very enclosed world. And Abby it happened to be 10th generation descended from, uh-oh, I thought I had it. Bayam Tal, oh, I'm sorry, the founder of the Hasidic movement, which is important, the generational uh, ancestry. And she wanted to grow up and be just a, a great Hasidic housewife. She wanted to have lots of babies and be a uh, committed mother to her children in the Hasidic faith. But Abby, Abby had a challenge. And Abby's challenge was that she was born into a male body. In the Hasidic community, there was nothing that mirrored this experience to her. She said there was not even any conversation about sex. Sex didn't even exist really until you were married and it was for the purpose of having babies. So it wasn't even a topic. It wasn't like abstination over birth control. They just didn't exist. So she's having this awareness of the experience, but as in a male body and the 10th generation, she's expected to move on to become a rabbi. So one day when she's 16 years old, she's in the library and she's reading two books by Haim Vital, who was the writer of, who wrote down the teachings of Rabbi Israel Luria, who was the founder of the Kabbalah, the modern mystical Jewish tradition. And, and Rabbi Hayim was a mystic as well. 16th century mystic, by the way. Not recent, 16th century. And she's reading the book. She gets to chapter 9, and she reads a sentence. And the sentence says, And sometimes a male will be reincarnated into a female body, and a female will be in a male body. And she froze. And she read it again. And again. And again. And then she picked up her books and went out to the forest behind the library and sat down. And she said, I sobbed like a baby. She felt for the first time in her life, her existence was justified. Her existence was justified. That just got right to my heart because I realized and recognized in that moment what gives us justification is how we mirror each other back to one another. So if you ask a child, what do you want to be when you grow up? What does that child do? The child looks around for a mirror. Who do I want to be like? We look for people that resonate with our soul to mirror as an inspiration Rudolf Stein, who founded the Waldorf School, said the way to start any spiritual journey is to find out who are your inspirations, who resonates with your soul. But what if you have nobody in your community, there's nothing in your tradition that mirrors who you are, then you have no existence. We are all seeking to find a place where we feel safe enough to find our true voice, to find our true soul. So Abby had to ultimately leave the Hasidic community because for her to fully step into this reality, she could no longer be in the Hasidic community, especially a rabbi. And when she went out into the greater community, it was a, a completely unknown world to her and terrifying world, and she had no sense of where to go. Where was she safe to talk to people? Where would she be welcomed? So someone mentioned to her, well, if you see a rainbow, that's when you know you're safe. And that became her guiding post. 
where she saw a rainbow, she knew she could go and start speaking about who she really is and find people who would mirror back to her love and acceptance. You're not alone. You belong here. We all want to belong. Relationships mirror back to us a feeling of belonging. We want to know that we are not on this journey all by ourselves in isolation, but there are other people who mirror back to us our soul, our essence, who are be- who we are. And I thought about this even as we're looking at our community, we're, we're in conversations about how to create our space here. And I thought, wow, we have nothing on our walls that say rainbow. You know, say you're welcome here or on our website, because my assumption is, and she said that, because she was talking to a very sort of liberal, open-minded audience, she said, you assume that everybody knows that you're welcoming, but when you're in the closet, you're in it for a reason, you're not in a safe world, and you don't know where those safety places are, you are not in that world that you all guys in are in all the time, so you need, we need these symbols to say, you are welcome here, and I have friends who are of African-American descent and, and people of color, and they say, if, I, if they walk into a space, I was having a conversation with them, and they were saying, if I walk into a space and there's no, nothing on the walls that depict my culture or my history, I feel that I'm not welcome there. Who are we and what are we mirroring back to the world around us, individually and as a community? Are we a safe space where we can say, you are welcome here? Because it's not necessarily that we're all the same. You know, not everybody is LGBTQ. <laughs> what, what, what was that? It goes on. <laughs> and many more letters. Or people of color. We're all different. But we can say that through the power and the presence of the divine essence that is within all of us, that we can accept and support and see and celebrate every person's uniqueness and say everybody is welcome in our community. We are all equal. We all have our uniqueness, but we are all equal. You are home and you are safe with me. And so that becomes this wonderful opportunity in our life to say, do people feel like they can belong with me? Do they feel they are safe with me? I remember one minister put it, which I loved, are people safe walk, walking through my head? No one else can see, but in my own thoughts. Are people safe in my own thoughts? What a beautiful thought. And it's an interesting thing because relationships also can be our greatest place of dis-ease and comfort. That even when we do love somebody, when we fully show up to be connected, when we fully show up to be present with another person, what starts to happen is our dark side comes up, things that we don't like about ourselves or about the other person because it's much easier to see their stuff than our own. So they start chafing away at us. We feel uncomfortable. We don't want to be around them or we don't like these things about them and we don't like things about ourselves. What is our mirror? What I loved about Richard Rohr's reading today was in order for us to be a safe place, we have to be a safe place for ourselves. If we cannot be a safe place of acceptance of our own limitations, of our own weaknesses, of the, our own faults, we certainly can't be that for anybody else. In fact, we may not even know that that's why we're rejecting them is because their faults are reminding them of our own faults, of our own limitations. And so we need to do what, there's a lot of, it's called shadow work, doing shadow work of being honest and open about our own limitations so that when someone comes to me and they can be safe even though they're not perfect. Because part of this real idea in our teaching is that we're all whole, perfect, and complete, and we are, and we're also all imperfect. And we need to carry that divine paradox together, that of the wholeness and the perfection, but also of our limitations and our weaknesses. And in fact, when we are more open about our weaknesses and our vulnerabilities, we actually get to know our wholeness better. We get to know the depth of spirit in ourselves and each other. I happened to watch two episodes of, do you ever know the old TV show House? cranky old guy, doctor, and uh, these two episodes, it was just amazing, it, it moved me so profoundly, it was, it's 
for, farther on to the TV show, it's like the 60s, and in the first two episodes, he's, he has, they, they mirror him after Sherlock Holmes, so he has a Vicodin habit, like Sherlock Holmes had his habit, chemical addiction, and it sort of tears him apart. He finally has to go into a psychiatric hospital rehab center. He agrees to go because he realizes he can't do it anymore. No matter how smart he is, he just can't handle it. And the two episodes were just so beautiful and profound and reminded me of why I loved working in a psychiatric hospital. So when he goes there, he's trying to manipulate everybody because that's what he's good at. He's so smart. He, he, with the doctors and the nurses and the other patients, he's just playing games all over the place. And that's what we do when we feel unsafe. We start playing games with people. We try to get our agendas met through these really clever ways. But through consistent love and care and healthy boundaries. We don't, and we're not afraid of healthy boundaries. When we're, when we're healthy with ourselves, we can be healthy with other people. Healthy boundaries doesn't mean I reject you. It means I actually respect you enough to have a healthy boundary. In those two episodes, you see the walls just drip away, and suddenly that arrogant, self-possessed person becomes utterly humble and real. And all the patients and the staff start deeply and profoundly connecting. And I just, at one point, I just started sobbing. Like, this is why I loved working in a hospital. Because there wasn't arrogance. There wasn't a puffing up of I'm better than somebody else. Everybody there the, the, was feeling a sense of their own limitations. They were in a hospital because they were in pain. And the staff recognizes that. I, I know for me, I just felt so honored to be in a, in a place where there were no masks. I felt, wow, do I, how do I get this incredible honor? And that's, when I was watching the episode, it was like that feeling. It's like, wow, these people are just completely themselves. And the love and the relationships, it's everything that I experienced. It was so profound and so loving. And I thought, we live in a mass world of people who are, have these walls and masks up, and wouldn't it be as great as being in a hospital where all those walls just start dropping down, the masks and the pretending and the arrogance, and I'm this and I'm that, and we just saw each other heart to heart. We didn't pretend. We just loved each other just as we are in all our nakedness, in all our weaknesses as well as our strengths, in our beauty as well as when those times when we don't feel beautiful. Abby said something that was so interesting. He was talking about Jewish history, and he said that the, what he found in Jewish history was that when the Jewish people were not being imposed upon by an outside culture or religion, when they were just given, they were just being themselves and they didn't feel like they needed to protect their way of being, they loosened up a lot. They weren't as rigid. They weren't as definitive in their borders and boundaries of what it meant to be Jewish. That in fact, the, the borders came up the more they felt, imp- they felt fear that they were going to be changed, that they were being asked to be changed, to, be, to become like the Christians or to have to incorporate the, con- the culture that was around them. So they became strict. And I was thinking, that's what we do when we're in fear. You know, when we're in fear, if there's a jaguar there and we see it, we're going to get really narrow and focused. We're not open up to the possibilities. We've got to get narrow because our survival depends on it. It's a crisis moment, and we have to be totally focused in that moment. But as oh, what's her name? Dr. Sarah Cavanaugh was saying, that is a terrible way to go through life, that a crisis moment of becoming narrow and rigid and focused is not how we want to deal with all the complexities and the challenges in our own life and in the life of the people around us. In fact, the energy that we need is playfulness, creativity, out-of-the-box thinking, and we don't do that unless we feel safe and open and available. And that's why this teaching, the, the awareness that there's this presence and this power that is always good, that is always loving, to keep anchoring that in that so we can feel safe enough to allow when diversity comes, because the, the thing that I got was, wow, when diversity comes, some people shut down, create barriers, get warlike, separation, because the fear is I'm going to lose something of who I am. And what I've been thinking about is that I'm seeing that everywhere in our culture right now. You know, the climate change. We're terrified of climate change, so we, we get really intense and attacking 
and we get in the politics. It's, it's so hard in the politics right now. Everyone's attacking everybody, you know, even the Democrats. I see people who support different candidates. Not everybody, but there's a lot of attacking than the, between the Republican and the Democratic Party. And what's all the attacking behind? We're afraid. We're getting rigid. We're getting narrow. We don't see the people who are, who are different than us as being deserving of love and respect. And so I know that I've been really working on practicing, on seeing where, how can I connect with people who have fundamentally different ideas than, than I do. Because what I notice is when they post things that upset me, I feel frightened. I feel I'm in crisis mode. I feel our world is in crisis mode, our country's in crisis mode, and I want to get narrow, and I want to rigid, rigid, and I want to focus and attack, <laughs> or deal with that jaguar. And that is not the way to handle challenges. That's how we've done it always, our history of war and war and war. It does not lead to greater awareness and love and healing. So how do I approach something if I'm inherently afraid of it? I'm afraid of its impact on my life. And that could be in a personal relationship. It can be in with the collective what's happening in our culture. How do I respond if I'm in fear? I can't. I can only respond from fear. So I, we have to find ways collectively in powerful ways to know that the power and the presence of pure spirit, this abundance of love that that no other person can take from us. No one else is good honoring and respecting people that are diverse from us. Never, never, never takes away from the fullness that we are. To really know that, to really know that our own darkness never can limit or harm or endanger who we really are. To really start practicing with our own shadow work, with the people in our lives, to say that nothing can ever limit the love that is in my heart. That love is the infinite power of pure spirit. It is abundant. There is no limit to it. It doesn't stop. There's not a, there's not, we don't have to grab for the little love that there is. There's infinite oceanic abundance of love in all forms, in all ways, and uniqueness. And our hearts are big enough and wide enough to accept all that we are and all that everybody else is. And that takes work. It takes discomfort, as we heard in the reading. It takes challenging. And it takes challenging ourselves and each other to take us deeper and deeper into this powerful, vast oceanic love, and that's what gives our love this depth as well as this height and this width and this length. We live every day recognizing that each of us are mirrors for one another. Everywhere we go, we are mirroring back to people how they perceive themselves how they experience the world. What are you mirroring back? What are you mirroring back to the person at Starbucks, at the grocery store? How are you mirroring back to someone who has a completely different worldview than you, who seems to have totally different values, so values that so upset us that, they, that you just want to cut them out because it just feels better to cut them out. I remember listening to a minister once, and he said to me, he said, well, I didn't do very well my first five years of ministry because I basically was off with their head and out of here. <laughs> I said it wasn't very effective. But it almost seemed easier at the time. It's so much easier to deal with pain by cutting it out and getting rid of it rather than facing it because when we have to face it, we have to feel it in ourselves. We have to feel the fear in ourselves. We have to feel the anger in ourselves, the frustration, the hopelessness, the crisis-oriented. We, got to, we have to come absolutely in touch with ourselves with those feelings so we are not so thrown by what's happening externally. I remember working with this young lady, and she came, and uh, I do a lot of work on myself, and she came one time, and she was furious with me, just yelling and how I had hurt her and all this stuff. Um, uh, this was a, a client relationship. And I was able to just be present with her anger. It did not throw me. I didn't go... Like, oh my gosh, she doesn't like me. Oh my gosh, we're not together or we don't resonate. I knew our love. I knew the divine presence. It was strong enough to be able to withstand the anger and the frustration and that which needed to be expressed. That's who we need to be. Not fake. I got to be nice because that's not, I mean depth. 
be able to be present with other people's fear, to be present with their anger, to be present with their rage and their sadness because I've been present with my anger. I've been present with my rage. I've been present with my hopelessness. And the more we're present with our own self, we can be present with other, and that's where we become this powerful, transformative forces for love in this world. You with me? That's all I have to say today. <laughs> I told Jack I'm going to do a straight and to the point. No messing around. Ab- By the way, Abby wrote a book called Becoming Eve. I, have, I just heard the interview this week, and it just it so completely moved me, but if you're interested, that's her book, Becoming Eve. And we all are the divine becoming, all the colors, because what we know as we're slowly shifting into prayer is that even though we all have our unique expressions, that all of the unique expressions are sourced by the one power and the one presence. And we choose to stay connected to that day in and day out in our life. In the midst of all our emotional swings, we stay connected to the one. No matter what's happening externally, we stay connected to the one. And so we are in this time of prayer recognizing that this one power is truly one power, not multiple powers, not your power and my power, not us versus them, one power that transcends all physical form, that transcends everything that is on this earth. It is beyond our concepts and our words. It is infinitely, infinitely alive and awake all of the time it doesn't we cannot make it happen we cannot fix it we cannot limit it with anything that we say do or act it is this infinite oceanic love is it is our very existence right here and right now we stand in that awareness and as we stand in that awareness for ourselves individually we stand that that is the existence of this community and all life on this planet no matter what is unfolding in time and space beyond time and space love is it is the infinite power it is the infinite source of everything on this planet earth and so it is in that place as that place that we speak and commune with one another we mirror back to each other the beauty and the power the essentialness the value and the importance of every single human being plant and animal that is this earth We are infinitely respectful. We are infinitely loving. We are strong and able to create boundary, healthy boundaries. We are able to say this works and this doesn't work, but never does that take us away from the infinite love in our heart. In fact, we're so strong in our heart that we can create boundaries without worrying of being offensive because we know we are arising from pure, unconditional, unlimited love. And we hold this first and foremost for our own life. We allow all aspects of our being to be completely seen, felt, and accepted. You are welcome here. My sense of hopelessness, you are welcome here. My frustration, my fear, you are welcome here. I'm not afraid. The I am of us, this I am love is never afraid. Whatever is uncomfortable that's happening in our life, you are welcome here. You are a welcome guest. And in this, we begin to transform our lives and the people's lives around us. And we don't just begin, we continue day in and day out, for it is that presence and practice, daily practice, that anchors all of us in not just the words, but in the actions of pure, unconditional love, of the many colors of love shining forth through all life as us. And in this deep and unconditional acceptance, we celebrate and give thanks for this organization called the Centers for Spiritual Living, recognizing and celebrating all those who stepped into leadership positions this past week and were voted into their various leaderships to run this organization that is committed to a world that works for everybody. And we celebrate Reverend Edward Vallune and send him our love and our blessings as he has said yes to being the spiritual leader 
for this organization in the years to come to stand alive and out loud in the public realm to be seen and to known and to say everyone matters. Everyone matters. So we bless Edward V. Yoon and we bless all of these leaders and we bless this lighthouse community and we bless our beautiful Therese Sals knowing that she lives this every day. We feel her love. We feel her openness. She never asks for anything in return. She just gives from that love, that infinite wellspring that is within her. And we feel her energy and her power. And we know this power and this energy that has called her into this community to give with her whole heart, body, mind, and soul, that this continues to go before her and makes any crooked places absolutely straight. She is greeted by the divine beloved where she is going. She is surrounded in light and love and purpose and meaning and joy and intimacy and creativity, that she loses nothing on this trip. It shifts, there's change, but she loses nothing. That this infinite, glorious presence of God absolutely walks and talks with our beautiful Therese in her new life. And as we celebrate and hold Therese, we celebrate and hold each and every individual who is a member of this community. For all the love that is in this room right here and right now that completely embraces this entire universe as it is right here and right now in this moment, we give thanks. And in this thanks, we let it be, and we say together, and so it is. Amen.